Welcome back to Business Week. I'm joined now by Kelvin Emanuel, co-founder and CEO of Dairy Hills Limited, an integrated agro-allied company focused on developing a manufacturing business for industrial starch and animal fields. He's also a public policy analyst and economist. Great to have you on the show with us today, Kelvin. Good morning. I think Thank it's your you. first time on Business Week, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So we're going to start with oil. Yes. I know that's one of your favorite subjects. <laughs> um, oil holding back gains, the Russian crisis escalating. What can you tell us about the future direct uh, trajectory of oil prices? Well, when, when you look at the forward guidance from OPEC, uh, you see that Saudi Arabia continues to cut um, output. And Saudi Arabia is the de facto leader of OPEC, mm. continues to cut output. And Nigeria in that uh, window of member countries is, you know, OPEC says that they don't expect Nigeria to ramp up significantly over the next 12 months because of the issues of crude oil theft in Nigeria mm. and all the legacy issues it has with production. Um, I honestly believe that marginally you're going to see oil prices inch closer to somewhere around 90 or $95 per barrel, okay. which will affect the cost of um, landing PMS into Nigeria until at least Dangote refinery is up and running. Um, I also think that, for example, the exchange rate is going to play a significant factor mm. in the price of PMS in Nigeria. And going forward to 2025, if you look at the forward guidance for crude oil, um, I honestly don't see the future of um, Nigeria and OPEC if Nigeria gets its axe rise with crude oil theft and the um, number of um, drilling rigs you have. Mm. Um, so when you, when you say you don't see the future of Nigeria and OPEC, what is the alternative scenario? The alternative is to do what Qatar did, even if Qatar, Qatar is a gas nation. Indonesia and Qatar mm. left OPEC four or five years ago. Um, the alternative is to go out of OPEC and stay in the declaration of cooperation mm. as a non-OPEC um, member. Because if, for example, Nigeria ramps up, which is a big if, um, above 2.5 or 2.2 million barrels per day, for exports, mm. I, I don't see how Nigeria is going to squeeze itself into OPEC's strategy. Especially the quotas, the e supply cuts, exactly. yeah, mandated supply cuts. Exactly. And um, oh, clearly, Russia and, and some other countries have a bit more flexibility because they're part of OPEC Plus. So, do you see a scenario where Nigeria could still partner with an OPEC to influence uh, global oil yes, supply? Yes, if it stays in the declaration of cooperation, it can partner with OPEC to influence um, the global mm. supply price. But it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Of course. Because on one hand, you look at the situation where NNPC has independent revenues that it gives to FAC. Mm. Um, the planned unification and devaluation of the Naira means that the benchmark um, exchange rate in terms of exchange difference that is reported to FAC is mm. higher. So far, it's between 39 and 42% marginally up. The government gets more revenue. The flip side of that argument is that the more crude oil price goes up, the higher the cost of PMS goes of up course. in the regulated market. Mm. So it's a double-edged sword. It's, it is, it, and it's always been. And we'll come back to the issue of the exchange rate later, but I wanted us to touch on Moody's. I mean, these ratings agencies are now like the stars of the show. They downgraded the U.S., the sovereign. Now they're downgrading U.S. banks. What, is, what do you think is informing the sudden sweep, I guess? Well, for U.S. banks, you know, with the failure of... Um, SVB. Yeah, Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank. Bank, the fact that it was doing securities lending, it had um, a structure, a banking structure that was completely different from regular traditional US banks. Um, and then First Republic was sold, I think, to JP Morgan. Mm. JP Morgan had an investment in First Republic, and then in order to prevent it from going under mm. and going to administration, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, JP Morgan took over First Republic. It's, it's very much in line that Moody's actually downgraded U.S. banks. Mm. Um, for Nigeria, however, when you look at the country risk premium in Nigeria, um, I honestly, I did a num number check on the country risk premium and I realized that Nigeria CROP is somewhere around 16.02%, um, about okay. 1,602 mm. um, basis points from 990 basis points like four years ago. Mm. And when you look at... The CVA report, for example, you look at the fiscal position of the government, you look at the fact that um, Nigeria's um, sovereign rating is somewhere at CA1 for Moody's, which mm. is um, junk status, um, and it's difficult for the government to go and raise a euro bond with a junk status and bond rating. And you look at the um, impact of that sovereign rating on companies that are quoted and companies that are 
have FX exposure, yeah. you understand why um, we're where we are with the ratings agencies. Even if the ratings agencies have, uh, for example, Fitch and S&P has revised the outlook, but they've not um, upgraded. The so they put us on yet. watch, or what, they, they, what exactly have they, they done? The S&P has and uh, Fitch have put us on watch. Mm -hmm. they've, uh, I've revised it from negative to stable, mm -hmm. because if you look at the fiscal position on, of the government, um, devaluing and reunifying planning to unify the exchange rate is actually positive for um, government revenues. Uh, if you also look at the fact that the removal of PMS subsidy and deregulation according to sections 2051 of the PIA mm -hmm. uh, has actually saved the country from going to borrow money to refinance um, existing debt, to pay mm -hmm. debt servicing, and also to um, pay PMS subsidy, which is actually against them um, sections um, 45 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2007. So it, the outlook for Nigeria is positive in terms of the pace of reforms that the government is implementing. If we lo you look at the fact that the government has started the process of harmonizing the federal, state and local government taxes, mm. the government has also said that it's going to take um, the revenue collection duty of 62 MDAs and give it to fair and federal and revenue, mm. which is the right thing to do. Yeah. I expect a tick up. Um, mm. I expect and an it's, increase. it's also even expecting to increase the tax to GDP ratio to about 18 percent, which is somewhere yeah. currently at 7. But, but you're you're starting to paint a somewhat positive picture. But we have this issue of CBN and our you know producers just flashed on the CBN accounts the key the key numbers up there. These accounts have been published for the first time in many years. And some of the figures that have come out are staggering for the general public. But for you, I know you've been talking about this issue for a while. Which ones are particularly challenging? Which ones stand out? We saw the, the ways and means uh, statistics, uh, the interesting um, um, net interest income, mm. which should be going up. The question is, should the CBN even be seen as a profitable entity? I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Kelvin. Well, you know, the ways and means um, is something I've always talked about. I mean, if you look at the fact that the suspended governor of the CBN actually um, raised CRR from 16%, um, for fifth, I, I think 15%, to 32.5%. It's over. back down to 10% for merchant banks. For merchant banks. For, merchant for, banks for commercial only. banks, yeah. it's still 32.5%. Yeah. Non-discretionary cash reserve ratio. Mm -hmm. It mopped up this monies and used it to give ways and means to the federal government in contravention of Section 38 of the CBN Act of 2007. They also use quantitative easing to shock the difference. And you saw what that did to the exchange rate, and mm. you saw what that did to um, the position of the central bank, considering that the, sorry, the government, considering that um, um, the interest on overdrafts are MPR plus 30. Mm. It, 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 it's, it's, it, for me, I think the, the biggest surprise is the fact that the Nigerian Senate did not um, exercise their oversight duties. The Nigerian Senate, even when there was a call for sterilization and securitization of $53 billion in ways and means, did not order for forensic audit mm. into how, how, how the monies were spent. Um, the, the, for me, the greatest shock in this annual report that was released, even if before the report was released, I had um, kind of gotten an inkling that the foreign reserve position that the central bank was declaring is actually not the actual state of things. I'm not surprised that the actual state of things is somewhere 50% uh, lower than they are declared at 33.6%. Is that because of the encumbrances? So what we're talking about is actually net reserves, the yes. true picture. Yes. Yes. Uh, and to be, to be honest with you, the most shocking part is the part about securities lending. I understand that JP Morgan Chase and um, Goldman Sachs are external asset managers for the mm. Central Bank of Nigeria. But taking a loan of $7.5 billion without the approval of the Nigerian Senate, mm. without you communicating to the Senate president, without getting the input and the votes of the Nigerian Senate, is unconstitutional. Yeah. So I, I have to ask you, given what we know now, in terms of the institutional reform aspect of the CBN, what then has to be done going forward? Because it's both a symptom of leadership and governance, or, or what exactly is the issue? Is it the relationship with those who give the approval within the Senate, or is it the reforms need to be within CBN itself? I honestly think that the whole structure of the central bank has to be changed. I think the central bank has to be broken into the UK style of regulatory Okay, structure. where you have a prudential regulatory authority, which is a regulatory arm. And, and Consumer then? Financial Protection Bureau okay. and Ombudsman. Yeah. I also think that um, certain areas of the BOFIA 2020 and the CBN Act of 2007 needs to be amended, mm -hmm. Sections 2, 
sections 9 and 11, sections 20, sections 24. That's sections a lot of sections, Kelvin. Yes, and sections 50. And, yeah. and, and I'll tell you, sections 51 and 30, for example, talk mm. about the fact that every year the CBN is obligated to do an audit and send the financial reports to the Senate and then gazette it to the public, mm. sections 51 and 30. CBN violated that act repeatedly over the years because if this was audited and sent, then Nigerians would have raised the alarm and called the National Assembly representatives to rise up to the occasion. Okay. Right? Yeah. I also think that um, Section 38 needs to be codified, that in the future, that um, the CBN cannot raise ways and means limit above the 15% that they are raised it to mm -hmm. uh, early this year without an express approval of two-third majority of the Nigerian Senate placed like a debt ceiling. Mm. I also think that, you know, Sections 9, 11 and 9 that has to do with the events that happened in Q1 of 2021, 12, 2022 needs to be looked into mm. about um, the power and authority of the CBN and abuse of the office principal officers of the Central Bank of Nigeria. I honestly, so you need a comprehensive review. I mean, it's, it's going to be a comprehensive and a long process. And, you know, it's the, the thoughts around the various things that need to happen. It seems like this needs to be a collaborative approach. There's a regulatory aspect. There's also looking at the structure and makeup of the CBN. And there's also the holding the CBN to account against the laws of the land that have been stipulated. But there are other issues that we need to talk about so we don't run out of time. Uh, I guess related to that is Tinubu vowing to end Nigeria's reliance on external on public borrowing and then the Naira plummeting at one point to 950 Naira to the dollar on the black market. This convergence that we're looking for, it's, it's basically gone. So I'd like you to comment maybe very briefly on, on those two issues. See, for, for example, the Central Bank of Nigeria needs um, the fact that it created like a non-deliverable false market, non-exchange traded derivatives is good. That's why you have the forwards on their balance mm -hmm. sheet. The problem now is that you, you can't keep like a black market premium above 5%, currently somewhere between 16 and 18%. Mm. The, the central bank needs to collapse the IE window into the spot rates and allow the market to float. Then what you need to do, because there's crisis right now, and um, from all the sources of FX revenues, um, independent revenues from NLNG and NPC, what they paid $1.1 billion in dividends is annual. Mm. NLNG to NNPC that holds the FG's 49% equity in terms of um, ONG companies, in terms of um, foreign direct investors and FPIs who are not coming because of um, the position of the external reserves that are encumbered, um, because of um, diaspora remittances. Um, you saw how much the central bank used in this um, RT200 program to incentivize mm. flows that didn't really lead to substantial uptick um, in terms of net export proceeds. Mm. Um, you can see that reflection in the IE window that has improved. But the problem with that net export proceeds is that when you have a black market premium between the IE rates and the spot rates, mm. companies are in, will not be incentivized to bring in their dollars to exchange at the IE rate. They'll take it to the IM spot rates or keep it abroad. Yeah. So, for, for example, for me, I think it's time to call in the Calvary. It's time mm. to collapse the IE rate into the spot rate. It's time for Nigerian government to use its uh, special drain rights at IMF mm. to access um, intra-central bank lending and collateralize its SDR units as a low-income country. So essentially what you're saying, a fully liberalized regime is not just unifying the rates, but it's actually moving from the IM window to the spot market. Yes. To allow, then that would then allow for convergence Th with a black that, market that's rate. That's the only way you yeah. can find price discovery. Yeah. This thing where you keep it at a particular level and expect that the spot rate is going to come back to meet the eye. It's mm. not just not going it, to it's work. It's clearly not happening. And of course, liquidity, I mean, people have focused so much on liquidity, but there are also other variables and, and things that need to be tackled. Plus, plus there's also the issue, for example, of um, FBI is saying that the Nigerian Treasury bill yields are not in, aligning in convexity mm. to the inflation to interest yield curve. Now, I understand the other side of the argument that the more that um, yield collapses or um, depreciates, the more the mm. government has a responsibility to pay investors who are holding government securities. Mm. But, you know, it's like two sides of a coin. You have to look at it and mm. weigh the balance of the scale to see which side it tilts. Yeah, indeed. Um, Kelvin Emmanuel, this, we could go on and on talking about this issue, but because we've run out of time, it's been so great to speak to you and hopefully we'll get you back on the show to help us chart this very interesting course we're facing now on Thank the you. Nigerian economy and especially in monetary policy issues. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you.